every pet parent I talk to is on the fence about this topic. And I'm not even the one bringing it up. But there are so many people on one side and so many people on the other side. And I need to know what side you're on. What is it that I'm talking about? It's this DCM argument that we keep having because nobody actually knows what's going on. I want to break it all down to you, give you updated information on it, and then I need to find out from you where you stand. So stick with me. We're going to talk all about DCM. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So I'm updating my blog post on DCM in dogs. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's dilated cardiomyopathy. Now there are actually two types. There's a primary and a secondary type of DCM in dogs. And this has been in the news. Well, I don't know how prevalent it is in the news today, But I think that's because so many people are still so confused over it and everything they post just gets, you know, when when the media talks about it, everybody just gets all riled up again. And that's because they just have not adequately explained it to people. They haven't figured it out. They haven't, quote, figured it out. They potentially could figure it out, but it's not, it, it would definitely be to the detriment, I think, of big pet food. And that's just not what you know, we always say follow the money and that's where you'll, you'll find your answer. So I, I do have a blog on my website. I will put the link in the show notes. I don't want to rehash everything in the blog post. So what I want to do is just kind of summarize what DCM is, what we know, what we knew, and then some new information has recently come about that I think is really worth looking into. And I think you should be paying attention to it uh, because this is really where things can get, I don't want to say wonky. Things are definitely, they will more than likely get heated again. If this gets back in mainstream news, uh, pet parents are going to lose their minds once again. And I think this is completely the response from the average pet parent, from people in general to what has been occurring in dogs is absolutely warranted, especially because they're not, quote, figuring out what's actually going on. In fact, the FDA formally, since I posted the blog originally, formally closed their investigation stating that they could find no links between diet and DCM. Uh, there There was nothing that they could confirm, yada, yada. So let's, let's break this down a little bit because I don't bring this up. This is not something that I bring up in general when talking to a pet parent, whether I'm talking to somebody about training with their dog, or if I'm talking to, you know, a health coaching client, a holistic pet health coaching client, a nutrition client, whoever it may be, I am not generally the one bringing this up. It is somebody it, it is that client. It is the, the pet parent that is bringing it up to me because they just don't know and I get it. So what happened? What is DCM? What is dilated cardiomyopathy? And I told you there are, there's uh, two types. There's a primary and a secondary. So basically, and this is, this is the actual definition. It's a disease of the cardiac muscle, meaning the heart, that results in a decreased ability of the heart to generate pressure to pump blood through the vascular system. So nobody knows any definitive causes of DCM, though there are factors, and this is according to Cornell University, there are a number of factors, including nutritional, infectious, and a genetic predisposition predisposition. And the reason that that is in there and why there's a difference in a primary and a secondary is because primary, we do believe, is 
mostly at least genetic because it is very highly associated with certain breeds of dogs. So it could be heritable. And these breeds are Doberman Pinschers, uh, Great Danes, Boxers, and Cocker Spaniels. Now, DCM as a secondary disease is probably more environmental and more so dietary, um, nutritionally related. According to Cornell University, is most likely because of a taurine or carnitine and or carnitine deficiency. Um, though, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, the cases that were happening in the, what, 2019, 2018, 2019, 2020, they were seeing dogs with, quote, a nutritional <laughs> They, they didn't have necessarily, they weren't part of the uh, group of breeds that are genetically known to be, be predisposed to it, but they were still getting DCM, but they also were not testing low on a blood test for taurine. So what's really... Uh, what can be frustrating and difficult to pet parents is diagnosing DCM or even noticing the symptoms to go into your vet to talk about what is going on. So a lot of the symptoms, a lot of the symptoms of DCM are respiratory. So a decreased blood oxygen, which you're going to see shortness of breath, excess panting, um, coughing or a wet cough, exercise intolerance, tiring more easily, possibly even fainting, um, eating less or difficulty eating, again, due to problems breathing, fluid buildup in the abdom abdomen, which can present as sudden weight gain, rapid breathing while sleeping more than 40 breaths per minute when sleeping, and lethargy. So, you know, being extremely tired. And these are, again, signs of a decreased blood oxygen leading to respiratory distress, which can point to dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs. So again, so this is where, when we talk nutritionally, this is where the grain-free, the whole like grain-free debacle came about. Uh, that is because that roughly 90% of the reported cases coming from dogs being fed, uh, uh, we're coming from dogs being fed grain-free diets. That is a pretty strong correlation. It is not necessarily causation. What we know about these grain-free diets is that, well, they're still kibble, so they still need, you know, binders in them to keep the, the, the kibble pieces together so it's not just a bag full of powder. So they're high in things like peas, lentils, legumes, and potatoes. So at the time that I originally wrote my blog post on DCM, the most likely called interactions between ingredients in these grain-free diets, I included an excerpt from an email that Dr. Judy Morgan sent out to her newsletter subscribers. Um, she sent this out on January 14th, 2022, and I will try to condense this a little bit. Um, no one knows for sure why some breeds are having difficulty or whether the problem is low taurine, low taurine absorption, interference with taurine production, or an ingredient in the food that is toxic to the heart. The usual breeds such as Dobermans, Boxers, and Great Danes will continue to top the list for DCM problems, but why are we seeing it in small breeds and breeds that have not been genetically prone to DCM? And why are they not seeing this problem in Europe? So these are some of the big questions, and I think still some of the big questions. Uh, her email goes on to say, many of the dogs tested for taurine were found to have adequate blood taurine levels, even though they had full-blown DCM. So supplementing taurine may not be the solution to the problem. At this point in time, there are more questions and answers. And I think even, what, a year and a half later, we're still at the same point. There are still more questions than answers. So Dr. Morgan ended her email stating, while the cardiologists at Tufts recommend against feeding raw or home-prepared diets, I can only attest to the benefits I have seen in my own dogs by feeding these diets. All my cavaliers have developed mitral valve disease, a different disease from 
DCM, but heart disease nonetheless. They have eaten raw and home-prepared diets for years. The average life expectancy for a Cavalier once placed on heart medications is under three years. We have far surpassed that in all of our dogs. Coincidence? I think not. So Dr. Morgan is calling out the fact that there is a nutritional link. We just may not have found it yet, or possibly they just don't want to state what it is. What we do know is that the dogs of all the dogs that were diagnosed with DCM related to these grain-free diets, once they switched their food off of that diet, off of the grain-free diet containing whatever the suspected ingredients were, which we are attributing to uh, lentils, peas, chickpeas, legumes, and potatoes. These dogs that were removed, they did not continue to eat those grain-free diets. They have longer survival times than those dogs who did not switch their diets. And that was according to a PubMed article that was published. Another study that looked at Four dog breeds with the genetic predisposition to DCM showed that even with grain-included diets, those diets that also contain lentils, peas, and legumes resulted in higher instances of cardiac changes. So it seems that diets that that have included peas, chickpeas, lentils, legumes, and potatoes are potentially creating incompatibilities within nutrient profiles that are leading to increased instances of heart disorders. Now, what I want to say about this, that's that's basically, in a nutshell, the blog post that I will, again, have linked in the show notes for you to go through and read. It is, it's longer than that, and um, of course, a, f- a few more puzzle pieces will be in there for you to go check out and read on your own. But what I want to say is twofold. One, I do have some really, really interesting information um, that I'm updating with this blog post based on something I actually think I have mentioned in the podcast previously, but didn't talk about extensively. And Susan Thixton wrote an article about it. So I want to talk to you about that in just a minute. But also, I I think that it's not just peas, chickpeas, lentils, legumes, and potatoes. I, I think... And, and the reason that I, that I think it's not just that these particular ingredients are causing a problem, because these particular ingredients can also have benefit in food therapy, potentially. I don't love using them with most dogs, but in certain instances, there may be some value as food therapy. And I say that based on traditional Chinese veterinary medicine or traditional Chinese medicine and how all foods can potentially have some some uses as food therapy. So while I just in general for an average dog would not necessarily recommend any sort of starchy carbohydrate, including peas, chickpeas, lentils, legumes, and potatoes, there could potentially be some food therapy benefit for some animals some of the time, but this would be in a home-cooked diet versus these high heat process extruded rendered product that starts out as I'm going to say food source, some sort of food in the beginning, regardless of the quality of that food. Um, it did start out as food. And then through all of these processing, rendering and extruding high heat and all of these things that is done to that one-time food product, that potentially in combination with how these nutrients are reacting with one another, potentially also the fact that most of these companies are adding in what we call a premix compounds that are designed to provide, quote unquote, a balanced diet for your dog. Um, I think all of that put together is creating 
a per- like the perfect storm. So it's not necessarily just peas, chickpeas, lentils, legumes, and potatoes, right? Because if we think of these as whole food items, these, you know, we're, we're going to the grocery store and we're buying these really fresh, organic, wonderful whole foods and putting them together in appropriate amounts and quantities, <laughs> understanding that dogs are facultative carniv- carnivores and need primarily protein sources as their as their food source, that I don't think is necessarily the problem. It could be, there could be some, you know, nutrient incompatibilities that are causing what people call anti-nutrients. So creating this, this storm in the body that is causing nutrients not to be used and utilized because of how different things are, how different foods are interacting with each other. That certainly could potentially be at least part of the issue. But I think, again, this perfect storm of like all of these really, really harsh processing of these ingredients that may or may not work well together to begin with. And that is potentially creating this, this again, perfect storm. So that's kind of my take and my two cents. But what's really, really interesting is this article. And again, I think I mentioned this to you guys a while back in a podcast, but it was like just a little blurb in passing. We didn't really get into it. And Susan Thixton recently wrote an article about it. So stick with me. I'm going to talk to you about that in just one second. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. All right. So Susan Dixon of course, is is incredible. If you haven't listened to her episode on the podcast, make sure to go back and find her episode. She's just wonderful. And I couldn't imagine a better consumer advocate to have um, than Susan. But this particular article is entitled, what if dot, 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 AFCO nutrient profiles are linked to DCM. Oh, <laughs> so We talked about this previously, and again, it was really quick and kind of not very, very much in detail, but what I mentioned to you on um, a previous podcast episode was the idea that, and in fact, it might have actually been on Pet Health Junkies. So if you're not following the Pet Health Junkies podcast, I am a co-host over there, and along with uh, Pam Roussel and Janet Cesarini, so make sure to follow that podcast as well, but the idea that when you have a dog food or a cat food and it has this all these beautiful pictures on the front and the label on the back says what um you know what's what's in it what are the ingredients how to feed it so they're basing how to, how much to feed your pet on a certain number of calories consumed And so, for example, you take a bag of, I don't know, dog food. Um, Let's just say, you know, you got this huge bag of, of blue buffalo or science diet or whatever it is. And on the back of the bag, it says feed, you know, one cup per 20 pounds, or, you know, if your dog is up to 25 pounds, one cup a day, or, and I'm just making this up. This isn't actually what the bag says, but, um, or, you know, two cups a day from 40 to 60 pounds or whatever it says on the bag. So imagine you're feeding your dog that is 55 pounds, two cups a day, because it says between 40 and 60 pounds, two cups a day, right? And you're feeding your dog two cups a day. And you go into your veterinarian's office and your veterinarian says, your dog is a little pudgy and we need to get that weight off because it's going to help, you know, 
with so many things, it's going to extend your dog's life. It's going to make their mobility easier, yada, yada. Of course, we all, we all know, we know extra weight equals bad things happen to the body and, you know, we, we don't live as long, blah, blah, blah. That's true all around with all of us. So we're like, yeah, I need to get this weight off my dog. You're absolutely right. And your veterinarian says, feed them less. Feed them 10% less. Feed them 20% less. Let's feed them less. So they, and and to us, we're like, sure, that makes sense. Calories in, calories out, right? If they're getting fewer calories in, then they're not going to continue to gain weight. They're hopefully potentially going to lose weight. Well, when you and I as humans look at our calories in, calories out, and we are hopefully also making really, you know, more healthier choices about the foods we're eating because it's not just calories in, calories out. This may blow, like, blow your mind. <laughs> I don't know. I hope not. Yes, we do need to d- decrease the number of calories we're taking in, but we also, at the same time, with those calories we're still eating, need to increase the protein. That is how we actually lose weight. So with our dogs, we are continuing to feed high carbohydrate, starchy carbohydrate diets and and decreasing the calories in. Well, what's happening is one, your dog is still freaking hungry. um, So you're dealing with that. Also, because these pet foods are based on X number of calories per X number of pounds fed per day. And this is all done based on what we've already just talked about, these premixes that are going into the diet, um, which are synthetic vitamins and minerals that are actually providing what your pet needs, nutritionally speaking, because of all of the processing of the original food ingredients, which have little to no nutrition left in them. And I could go on and on and on about that for days, but I won't do that for, to you right now. So they're getting X amount of nutrients based on the amount of food fed. And when we feed less food, the nutrients also decrease. And because they're not eating whole foods, they're not eating real foods, they're getting synthetics. When we feed our body whole foods, that's very bioavailable. And our body can use, you know, say we eat a chicken breast or a steak and some broccoli and some asparagus, and we might have, you know, some raspberries or whatever it is, we're eggs, we're feeding the body. We're getting lots and lots of wonderful vitamins and minerals and amino acids in various amounts, different types of vitamins and minerals. And our body is taking all of that in and utilizing it. It's very bioavailable. And when we eat different things on different days, it's okay because it's all everything in that food our body is getting to use and utilize and it's fueling our cells. But when our dogs are eating this food with these synthetic vitamins and minerals and they're not getting enough of it, first of all, it's synthetic. So we're not getting the, you know, the abundance of uh, of vitamins and minerals and amino acids that you would say get out of eating a steak that's not happening. We're getting select synthetic vitamins and minerals that AFCO has deemed necessary for a dog to eat every single day, and they're getting less and less of them. So the actual nutrients are synthetic, poor quality, blah, 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 could go on forever, not from actual food. And then they're getting less than they should be getting because we are no longer feeding based on what that package says the nutrients your dog needs every day to honestly just survive. And that, that's the problem. So I haven't even gotten into this article yet. <laughs> there is a, uh, a study that Karen Becker and Steve Brown are part, and, and Susan Thixton are part of, 
And what they're doing is they are looking at this and how this is actually affecting dogs. So you have an active 30 pound dog. They're eating a complete and balanced food, commercially available food, and they're being told to eat three cups a day because that is what the manufacturer is recommending. That's the recommended feeding amount. An inactive 30 pound dog is eating that same complete and balanced diet, but they're being told to only eat two cups a day because they're inactive. Well, are they now nutrient deficient? They're only eating two, two thirds of the amount of food that that pet food company says is required to be a complete and balanced meal. So could eating less food result in nutrient deficiencies? And according to multiple research papers, nutrient deficiencies are linked to calorie restriction, to calorie restriction, which means a dog consuming less food. One study ca called risk of nutritional deficiencies for dogs on a weight loss plan. And again, I will link all of this in the show notes says several nutrients were found at risk of deficiency, inc including choline, methionine, cysteine, selenium, and so many others that I'm not going to name because it just keeps going on and on and on in both non-therapeutic adult maintenance diets and non-therapeutic weight management diets. So yeah, it looks like absolutely another, um, another study titled intake of energy protein amino acids and minerals by dogs under energy restriction for body weight loss when fed with commercial weight loss diets. Considering the observed intake of each dog, depending on the commercial product, intake below recommend, recommended for maintenance was verified for crude protein in 1 to 20 percent of the dogs, methionine 4 to 38 percent of dogs, methionine plus cysteine in 4 to 22 percent of dogs, and it just keeps going on and on. Although the diets presented elevated nutrient concentrations due to the reduced energy allowance, the estimated intake of several nutrients was lower than the recommendations, highlighting the importance of changing the formulation perspective. It, again, it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. As the FDA is aware, complete and balanced pet foods in the U.S. are required to meet AFCO nutrient profiles or complete a feeding trial. And as FDA is aware, the AFCO nutrient profiles are complete and balanced based on the caloric needs of active dogs, which is dogs kept in a domestic environment with strong stimulus and ample opportunity to exercise, such as dog households in the country or in a house with a large yard. What we also know is that most pet dogs in the United States are not active. In fact, they would be considered inactive. That's just how it is. Even if your dog is getting walked every day or even walked twice a day, that is probably not enough for your dog to be considered active under these guidelines. Again, this is something that Dr. Karen Becker, Steve Brown, and Susan Thixton are like combining their efforts and looking into and um, putting together a lot of information for the FDA and asking them to look into it more. It says, we are requesting the FDA to fully investigate the potential link of nutrient deficiencies caused by a dog or cat consuming less food, less calories, than AFCO nutrient profiles for active dogs require for a complete and balanced diet to DCM in dogs. Many other potential causes have been investigated. The very serious risk of nutrient deficiencies and their link to AFCO nutrient profiles deserve a full investigation as well. So um, again, I will link all of this in the description and I am updating my blog post with this new information. So please make sure to check the show notes for the link to the blog. And I also want to know what your thought is now, because again, so many people are so confused about it. And my only goal is, this is, this is actually a term that I recently learned and I, it is, it is perfect. It exactly fits what my goal is with you as a pet parent, knowledge transfer. I am learning I am figuring things out. I am studying and I am pulling together so much information to give to you so you can take that information and continue to learn to do better for your pets. 
I never, ever, ever want you to just take what I'm telling you at face value. I want you to take that information and say, let me look into that because that's interesting and intriguing to me. And I know I can be a better pet parent if I learn about this and maybe even make some changes in my or my dog's life. That's the goal. It is not for you to just hands down. Yep, Jessica said it. So it's gospel. That's not what this is. This is me giving you all of the information I have, everything I know, so that you can make your own educated decisions to go forth and be better pet parents. With that, y'all have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to give your pets some extra love for me. And next week, we will be returning with another incredible guest. Stay tuned. Oh, 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 oh.